You're listening to the Futures Podcast with me, Luke Robert Mason. On this episode, I speak to metahumanist philosopher Stefan Lorenz Sorgner. The future will rather be sort of the cyborg age or maybe even a biological age because we'll use the digital technologies and get information on biotechnologies in order to use them for increasing the likelihood of us living good lives. Stefan shared his thoughts on the debates surrounding contemporary transhumanism, the possibility of immortality achieved through mind uploading, and the ethical issues associated with gene editing, digital data collection, and life extension. Stefan, your new book, We Have Always Been Cyborgs, is an in-depth exploration of transhumanism and how it might be realized. So in a nutshell, what is transhumanism? Transhumanism is an approach which goes back to Julian Huxley. He coined the term in 1951. And the basic idea is that we should be using technology in order to break free from the boundaries of our current limitations. And why should we do so? Well, the basic assumption is that by doing so, we increase the chance of living a good life. And that's what we all want. That's what all the <laughs> philosophies in the history of philosophy have been about. They were trying to present an answer to the question of the good life. And the answer given by, by transhumanists in general is that our limitations are the challenge. And we can use a great variety of, of techniques, traditional ones, corporal ones, as well as sort of the later one, the latest ones, external ones by, um, and by doing so, we break free from the limitations we currently have, and thereby we increase the chances of living good lives. I mean, that, that seems to be one of the most important things that you can take away from how you've approached transhumanism, because it is that question of what does it mean to live a good life? As you just said there, in transhumanism, it, it gives us this possibility that living a good life is about moving away from human limitations. So how true is that? Is transhumanism key to living a good life or are there other ways perhaps we can pursue that sort of uh, mission? Is transhumanism necessary for living a good life? Well, people <laughs> have been living good lives before there's ever been a transhumanism. Transhumanism was only coined in 1951. So, and clearly people have been living, trans, uh, having been living good lives before that. But uh, before that, there have been other approaches which actually bear some structural similarities to transhumanism. Sort of, in particular, sort of the idea of Prometheus, which goes back to ancient Greek antiquity is bears mm. a lot of similarities to transhumanism. In, 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 in Prometheus, the idea comes up, no, we, we use a very special capacity, quasi-divine capacity, rationality, and we use that in our interest in order to realize something which we want to aspire to. And Prometheus is also known for having been the one who stands for humans creating other humans, humans giving shape to other humans. That also comes up in the Goethe poem on, on Prometheus. So again, yes, we can live good lives without explicitly being transhumanists. We can actually live in accordance with sort of the reflections of, of uh, transhumanism without ever having heard of the term. However, and this is quite an important step, sort of in, 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 a, in the contemporary discourses, Transhumanism is the only approach who actually explicitly addresses that revised understanding of who we are as human beings. We humans as being part of the evolutionary process, as fully being part of the empirically accessible world. So it's, it's a move away from the traditional self-understanding that our human nature is something which is immaterial, which is unchanging, it lies in our rationality, it lies in our free will, it lies in our being created in the image of God, mm -hmm. it lies in our immaterial autonomy. And transhumanists move away from this long-standing self-understandings of us, of human beings, which has been dominant in the Western world for, you know, 2,000, 2,500 years. And in addition, they also realize and they add the demand based on an empirical evidence. So, so far, 
if we've managed to increase our capacities and we've usually done so by means of the technologies, the, the likelihood of, a, of, of us living good lives also increases. And this has happened in the past 200 years. I mean, in the past 200 years, we've already mentioned, uh, managed to double of our life expectancy. We, in the average, managed to live 80 years instead of 40 years. That usually has, has quite a significant effect on the likelihood of us good, living good lives. But transhumanism is, is problematic because it's often considered this contested term. Francis Fukuyama famously described transhumanism as the world's most dangerous idea. I mean, how true is that, Stefan? And if it is true, should it be considered a badge of honor for transhumanists or should it be approached as an ethical dilemma that transhumanists have to deal with? Yeah, I actually agree with this. Yeah. Yes, it was it was what you just said. No, it is a badge of honor because no, it is a dangerous idea if you yourself stand for such an essentialist, a dualistic, an anthropocentric conception of who we are as human beings. If you mm -hmm. regard us humans to to have that specific divine spark which is immaterial, which was given to us by God, which was connected to our our bodily existence mm -hmm. since the time of fertilization onwards. If you stick to such an understanding, then yes, it's clear that transhumanism must be an extremely dangerous idea because it's it's moving exactly from that concept with all of its problematic paternalistic implications. So here, transhumanism is actually a possibility to realizing the multiplicity and great plurality of human flesh flourishing. It takes into consideration that all humans and all the other animals, we all have we all have very specific, idiosyncratic, very individual needs, needs, drives, desires. And we can realize them in particular if we use the help of the latest technologies. And by promoting the possibility, by enabling us to free ourselves from these paternalistic structures, which in our culture are still extremely dominating, the individual's likelihood of, of living happily, joyfully can be mm. increased even further. And I think that's a wonderful achievement, but we're fighting against encrusted structures which have been dominant for an extremely long period of time. And that's why there's a great amount of hesitation which many people have concerning uh, transhumanism. And, and Francis Fukuyama is, is, is a prime example for that kind of bioconservative approach. Well, where do you think some of those misunderstandings come from? I mean, for starts, what are some of those misunderstandings surrounding transhumanism and where do you think they originate from? In many circumstances, well, it might not always be just a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. It might simply be a clash of different, different anthropologies, a different understanding of what you regard worthy of for survival. So there are very different hesitations which people have concerning transhumanism. Hmm. So on the one hand, the socialist worry is that by using technologies and by inventing further technologies, what it leads to is it's undermining the equality we have on Earth even further. It leads to a further hierarchization of our society. Mm. And that can be a significant worry, actually. That's an issue which many transhumanists deal with and approach. I don't think it's a, a significant worry at all. It, it, it's definitely an issue which we can deal with, but it's a legitimate worry. And it's something which many, many transhumanists deal with explicitly. Then there's sort of the green worry, the green worry, which says, no, there is some, some nature and our natural existence, which is devoid of culture, we need to return to this properly natural existence, which lies before all culture sometime in an epoch long time ago in the past, which is an absolutely silly approach, actually, because, <laughs> I mean, there's so many natural things, you know, we naturally get cancer, Alzheimer and Parkinson, you know, all the natural disasters which have taken place from volcano eruptions to, to, to asteroids which hit the earth. They have caused the mass extinctions in the past. There have already been five max, mass extinctions before human beings have even entered the world. Mm. And as part of these mass extinctions, you know, up to 90 
5% of all species were killed. This was natural. So sort of that idea of nature being good and culture being bad is, is absolutely absurd. Then furthermore, there's the bioconservative, the religious worry that we are created in the, in the image of God and the, sort of we are doing something which only God should do. <laughs> If you stick to that understanding, then the transhumanism is a dangerous idea. However, one at the same time must always also keep in mind sort of what are the implications of, of such an approach? And the implications are very often that there's an objective meaning of the good which goes along with these monotheistic uh, religious traditions. There's a clear, this is only if you stick to these demands, you're good. If you don't, you're bad. And that means, and that is usually implied, yeah, yeah. You need to live as a, you know, as a man and woman in a heterosexual relationship, have, have kids. Otherwise, you're ill. You're not, you don't, you don't fulfill the natural requirements of what it means to be human. So we can see it. It really has some really dangerous and paternalistic and, and even uh, potentially totalitarian uh, implications if you take such a stand. So, and transhumanism is the, is the attempt to free ourselves from these encrusted structures. That's why I think it's, it's an incredibly important and relevant approach for increasing and taking, increasing the likelihood of us living good life and, and realizing that in a, in a non-totalitarian manner, in a non-paternalistic manner. Mm -hmm. So that basically the individual tribes, affects, needs of every single person gets taken into consideration. And, and I think that's just a that, that's just an amazingly wonderful achievement which we ought to promote much further. Well, you said the key word there, natural. And the joke in the book is that it is almost natural for human beings, homo sapiens, to extend themselves, to always be transitory. You say, in fact, we are constantly changing hybrid cyborgs. Or more simply, our turning into cyborgs is a development which has taken place since we became homo sapiens. So uh, what do you mean by that, Stefan? Exactly. This is a, a redefinition of what the term natural has stood for mm -hmm. for a long period of time. So instead of taking the human nature as being a higher uh, a Catholic nature, which represents an eternal idea of the good, I hear take seriously, basically, no, there is no outside of nature. We are all psychophysiological entities who are permanently in the process of change. We're even By nature, we are hybrids. We have more non-human cells which make up part of our body than we have human cells. And, and so it is what has recently happened actually as a consequence of, you know, it's, it, it was Martin Rosplatt's company which realized the genetically modified pig's heart, which was successfully transplanted into a human. So Martin Rosplatt is one of the leading uh, transhumanists. And so what What was realized here sort of we, we genetically modified a pig's heart, which was successfully transplanted into a human. And he's been alive now and flourishing for more than, for more than two weeks so far. Mm. And that's a wonderful achievement. So, and that's not something sort of that human, human animal hybrids. It's not, not something to be disgusted by or uh, which we ought to find yuck. But by realizing that we've always been hybrids, that, you know, that's just a, A development which is which could be uh, rephrased and defined as as natural as long as it's something which which promotes our our tries our interests our our wants and living longer healthily is something which most people identify with living better lives i think there's a, just a huge huge plurality of what people want in life mm. but there's one thing which most people i'm not saying all people identify was living a better lives was increasing the quality of lives but that's that's increasing the health span mm. living longer healthily and because most people identify this with in, an increased quality of life that should be taken seriously and that's what transhumanists are doing And we can realize that goal, and we've already managed to realize that goal in, in, in many different ways by developing new technologies. And that's, that's a wonderful achievement. Well, the point there is very nuanced, because what you're saying is living longer healthily. You're not saying 
immortality and why is it so important to separate those two and, and make it clear that a transhumanist goal isn't necessarily an immortalist goal? Exactly. That's so many media representatives <laughs> identify with uh, transhumanists with this weird bunch of young people who've been sitting in front of the computer too long, <laughs> um, who are dreaming of their minds getting uploaded to a, to a hard drive and then realize immortality and living in a, in a computer by living in a computer simulation or by having their minds being reintegrated into another organism. And that's just a caricature of what transhumanism is. There's always a sort of a grain of salt attached to it. And there's some transhumanists who might take it more seriously than others. The serious transhumanists, you know, they if they use the term immortality, then it's meant in a metaphorical sense. And it stands for the relevance of increasing the, the lifespan and, and not just the lifespan, but the lifespan during which we're healthy. Because just increasing the lifespan, again, is not something which people, most people would favor. I mean, if you're, if you're extremely sick and suffer all the time, and then you, 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 um, you would have to, or you could live another hundred years, that wouldn't necessarily in, in most people's interest. It might be in some people's interest, nevertheless, but it, hmm. the, most people would be extremely hesitant in, in that respect. So it also needs to be kept in mind that immortality is not even a realistic option. Most transhumanists affirm some kind of naturalist world order, which means there was a big bang at the beginning. There was an expansion of the, of the universe. Eventually it might sort of slow down the development and might come to standstill or the whole process of expansion will be reversed and a cosmological singularity will come about. And, you know, if there's a cosmological singularity with all the matter being united in a, in a, in one point of infinite density how should anyone any uploaded mind survives that so immortality in a in a naturalist framework cannot even be meaningfully be conceptualized however what we have realized we, we, we've doubled our life expectancy in some of the richest countries you know we even manage to have an average life expectancy of 90 years and and transhumanism um, also considers that you know even the 120 Two years, which so far seem to have been the longest lifespan of any human on Earth, doesn't have to be the maximum. Hmm. Because there are Greenland whales who've lived more than 200 years. There are other animals who've lived more than 500 years. And so by using the possibility of data analysis as well as genome editing, we have the possibility of integrating the genes responsible for longevity into humans and by radically breaking free of the boundaries of our human limitations with respect to that specific capacity. And it, the interesting thing was actually just recently, there is the axolotl. The axolotl is an animal which, if it gets harmed, if it loses a limb, if it loses, damages the brain, then it will regrow without any deficits. And recently, just actually this year, some scientists have managed to take the genes responsible for that wonderful capacity from the axolotl and transfer these capacities to other animals. And as a consequence, also had then the possibility of regrowing some of their their organs and the you know, and the brain without any any malfunctioning afterwards or without any deficits afterwards. And if that works, if we can transfer the capacities from the axolotl to other animals, it, there's in principle there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do so also and and take the genes responsible and integrate them in the human genome, which would be absolutely wonderful. Well, all of these possibilities, they sound so wonderfully exciting. Would you say, Stefan, that they almost point towards a world in which humanity lives in some form of utopia? Or is utopia a problematic word when it comes to transhumanism? I'm, I'm extremely hesitant when, when people invite me actually to give talks about utopia. I was, I was invited to Rotslav. It was a 
big event dedicated to the future of Europe. And the topic was utopias and the future of Europe. And sort of they were expecting of me presenting a transhumanist utopia. I think utopias is one of the worst things we should hold up, we should aspire for. And, and coming from Germany, you know, there have been some historical utopias affirmed and trying to realize <laughs> uh, in Germany. And we've seen the consequences, the devastating and terrible consequences mm. which have gone along with the Third Reich. And this has actually been, you know, this is, isn't only a case of the Third Reich. You know, whenever people try to realize any kind of ideal form of life, any kind of ideal political system which people wanted to realize sometime in the future and the people nowadays had to to suffer and dedicate themselves to creating that perfect future system it, it the only consequence it had it had some really it caused extreme problems for the people living nowadays it co co um, caused a lot of suffering it it caused a lot of you know, rejecting their own wishes and desires just for really realizing something, uh, a goal in the future, which, you know, never can get realized. So we should really just, you know, get rid of any kind of utopias. And the best way is to look at the technologies and possibilities, cultural possibilities as well, which we have at the moment in order to see what are realistic goals. What can be pragmatically done at the moment in order to increase the possibility that more and more people live better lives? And by doing so, we, we manage to, to increase the likelihood of, you know, uh, of people living better lives much, much more efficiently and more realistically. And most importantly, we don't, we don't force currently living people to 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 sacrifice themselves for a future which we'll never be able to realize and that's why i think please abandon all the utopias all i'm presenting is a sort of i mean, i am presenting certain visions guidelines pragmatic suggestions on the basis of what currently seems realistic but that's very different from this perfect utopian state for which we should sacrifice everything else I think that's an extremely important point that the present can often be sacrificed for a future that will never be actualized. And and you go as far as saying that transhumanism, instead of being associated with the utopias, should be associated with something called a nihilistic positive pessimism. Uh, so again, what do you mean by that? Uh, isn't transhumanism often associated with escapism rather than and, and utopianism and positivism rather than pessimism? How do those two function together? Well, many things have actually highlighting that specific phrase. And it, it, it takes some time sort of to just explain all the specific details um, of what you've just summarized. So you, you normally wouldn't think transhumanism aren't really pessimist. How can it make sense to identify suddenly transhumanism with a type of pessimism. Mm. And I, I take pessimism here in, in a philosophical stance, going back actually to Nietzsche, to Schopenhauer, to the Buddhist tradition. And here again, we, we see certain correlations and, and similarities and uh, uh, analogies which go on with many currently living transhumanists. So quite a few are, are actually Buddhists or have sympathies towards a Buddhist approach. And sort of that pessimism very much, which I'm referring to is, is, is also at the basis of, of the Buddhist pass, pessimism. And it basically says that that type of philosophical Buddhist pessimism ba basically stands for the analysis that life is suffering. All the permanent processes of overcoming which we need to experience is, uh, are correlated with some kind of, of suffering. If I want something, if I desire something, I don't have it. I need to do put some effort into it. And that causes me to suffer. So that's basically the basic condition, the basic transhumanist condition of uh, what it is, what it means to, to, to live in this world as being part of the world. So it is a permanent state of suffering. And then 
the best we can hope for is, uh, you know, momentary types of pleasure. Sometimes we realize a goal. Sometimes we realize a goal which we've been working hard for for ages. And then the fun we get, you know, it lasts maybe five minutes. In many circumstances, it only lasts one minute or even less. And then afterwards, we again strive for another goal. So that's that's sort of the basic condition in, in, in which we're all called. And that's what the pessimism stands for. On the other hand, uh, yeah, it is a positivity which I affirm, and I think we've got very good reason for being positive. And, and positive means here what we've achieved so far. And I've referred sort of to the to the realization which we've done concerning increasing the lifespan, but we can also refer to other capacities. I mean, since our work. Our world in data is, is a wonderful platform hosted by the University of Oxford, which basically shows how many of our challenges have been altered in, in the past towards the state we are in now. And, and one of the examples, one of the examples which I want to highlight is, is that of absolute poverty. So just 200 years ago, we've had an absolute poverty rate of more than 90% all over the world. Just in the UK, there was an absolute poverty rate of, of more than 80%. And in the meantime, globally, that absolute poverty rate went down to 10% in the past 200 years. And that, I think that's a wonderful achievement. And of course, 10% is still too many. Using and developing these new technologies has already made the probability get reduced from 90% to 10%. And that's, that's, that's why we can be positive about the correlations which the new technologies bring about. And with the new technologies, I always include, I mean, hygiene, education, these are all technologies. And, and so I think we've got good reasons for being positive about the correlations which new technologies bring along with. And another thing is another important insight is since the be beginning of this, this millennium, we are, uh, we for the first time in the world have, have more democracies than auth authoritarian mm -hmm. regimes. Again, we might not all agree that in, in, in some of the instances that some of the countries which claim to be democratic are democratic in our sense. But the important thing is, is that they are affirming democracy. They're aspiring for that. And their challenge is mm. concerning, a, you know, proper realization of democracy also in countries like, like Germany. And so we all haven't got like, um, they have challenges related to democracy, and it's easy to criticize. The important thing is to uphold it uh, as a goal, as something to improve, to work on permanently. That's the best we can do all the time. So again, that's another reason to be positive concerning the developments which are currently going on. It's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the word suffering, because when you hear the word transhumanism, you rarely think about suffering. Surely that's about overcoming and extending the human being, enhancing the human being, and not having a human being that would have to suffer. I mean, in David Pierce's understanding of transhumanism, where there's a hedonistic imperative, essentially would never suffer ever again. But it sounds like the suffering is key to us being a transitory species, there must always be something that we have to overcome for us to live in a transhuman state. Because if we did overcome all of these limitations, then then we would become the post-human, wouldn't we? What David Pierce and I have in common, and, and we share quite a lot in that respect, is that we both see suffering as a challenge. <laughs> His project is about sort of abolishing suffering and he thinks that can be, can be realized by means of transhumanist endeavors. And uh, I, I just don't think that's, that's really a plausible option. And that's sort of, again, my hesitation concerning any type of utopian stance. Um, I, I feel just, no, that's, that we need to acknowledge there is a suffering suffering and that's still part of us and that will still remain a part of us even the more we, we we use and employ and develop new technologies but we can already see that we've reduced a lot of suffering just by again just look 200 years back and it was normal for six-year-olds to work in a coal mine for seven-year-olds to live in a work in a closing factory in the, in the in, in in england then no one was considering you know having 
30 vacation years for workers, which is now widely taken for granted among the developed countries with the exception of the United States. So here we can see, you know, we, we, most of us today probably live better lives than, than the kings 500 years ago. And in that way, we've managed to reduce a lot of suffering just by having, you know, a hairdryer, central heating and being able to have a fridge by means of which we can keep our, our, our food fresh so that we don't get any health problems and we reduce the likelihood of, of getting ill. And that is reducing the suffering and increasing us being healthy and living longer. But abolishing suffering, I, I, I just don't think that's, I think that's an utopia. And I don't, I, I don't think it can be meaningfully conceptualized just in any way. But so it, it was David Pierce and I, we do, we, we both agree. And that's what many transhumanists do, sort of acknowledge the relevance of suffering, which also has implications concerning how we treat other uh, non-human animals and that we need to take them into consideration much further than this used to be the case in the in our cultural past. Well, what I'm trying to understand, Stefan, is is suffering a, a motivating factor for why someone might become a transhumanist? If they see that they are suffering, is that the reason why one might become a transhumanist? Or if we're no longer thinking about suffering, as you've said there, like we've we've got to a state where we are so privileged, especially in, in Western democracies, and that a lot of our needs are seen to and cared for, is that the point at which we start thinking with a transhumanist mindset and we think about what else we could do? And that's where morphological freedom comes into the fold and we start thinking about what aesthetic changes we can make to our body, things that don't allow us to escape um, suffering because we're no longer suffering, but because we're in that state, we now can sort of pick and choose from the smorgasbord board of differentiated ways of being as human beings. I mean, suffering is not only a challenge related to pure survival. One of the fundamental sources of suffering is just, you know, having some food to, to eat, having a nice place to stay. You know, that's that's the fundamental source of suffering. But there can be another other source of suffering which are related to to boredom, just having enough. Mm. But even the ones who are so privileged and 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 might get bored sometime, it also applies to them that they get ill, that they get cancer and and that causes a lot of suffering or alzheimer parkinson they, they they get old and they no longer have the capacities they used to have then when they were young so and it's not only i i don't think it it's just a reason to become a transhumanist um, mm -hmm. suffering is the basic motivation why anyone deals with philosophical issues or, or religious issues you know that's why the theodicy question no that's why you know why is there so much suffering in the world and that's that's what makes you turn to to God and hope, well, there's only suffering in the world. At least there will be an afterlife in which I can live blissfully ever after. And it only, you know, the suffering I only need to go through through, through these couple of decades I'm here at that in, in during that short lifespan on earth anyway. So suffering is is the basic challenge um, which makes us turn to any kind of explanation of how to deal with the world, of how to relate to the world. And what transhumanism in contrast to, to sort of monotheistic religion at least provides is a way to you know pragmatically dealing and finding solutions for the issue of suffering and traditional approaches rather provide us with reasons why we should not use technologies which are already available mm. so they hinder us from finding proper solutions to suffering in this world so right now for example it is also already possible just to choose fertilized eggs after in vitro fertilization and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. But in many countries in the world, that is, it's just illegal to do so. We have the possibility of choosing, choosing fertilized eggs on the basis of, you know, which, which egg is least prone to, 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 to really bad diseases. And therefore, we could reduce the suffering of the next generation. However, that selection procedure for reasons related to some, some ideological, religious, reflections and ideas is is illegitimate is is forbidden is legally forbidden and that is what i find so problematic so showing that in many circumstances we are being stopped from from choosing something from 
doing an act where no harm is being done to any other person. But it's still forbidden for, for some really abstruse reasons of us possessing the immaterial divine spark. And that's what I'm trying to show. We should allow the human flourishing to, to live, to continue, to express itself. Of course, we mustn't harm any other persons. And, but that, that is the case. I mean, there's, for example, when we, when we talk about marriage, we talk about, I mean, 50 years ago, it, homosexuality was seen as a criminal offense. Nowadays, you know, at least marriage, Marriage for all is widely taken for granted, but marriage for all still stands for, you know, two people being connected. In Colombia, for example, uh, three men said, you know, we, we are in love with each other. We want to get married. And in Colombia, it, they were granted the right to get married. And that is in the interest of the political system, because if one of the three persons gets ill, then it's the other two we need to finance them. So it, they, they relieve the burden from the, from the government to take care of the individual. So it's even in the interest of, of a, you know, the politics. That's the financial interest related to why a political system supports the institution and should support the institution of marriage. It's in the in financial interest of the political system. And they want to be together and they have specific rights associated to this contract of marriage. And again, this is something which we should grant in, in Western countries in Europe as well. And now we even got the possibility of having children with three biological parents. In the UK, that's a legitimate option, but only in the case that one of the potential mother-to-be has a severe mitochondrial disease. But why shouldn't it be an option for, for two women, a lesbian couple, who want to have biologically related uh, offspring. It's a technology which is already available and yeah. which, which we prevent them from using. Or if two women and a man say, we want to, you know, in love and we want to use that technology of biologically related offspring, we'll take care of the child. And then it would be quasi a traditional family. And why should the government prevent them from even getting married? They even, they even have a biologically related child. So it's in the interest of everyone in, involved and no harm is being done. But we, for ideological reasons, which, which are no longer justifiable or plausible uh, given our cultural framing, we still forbid these procedures. And these are problematic paternalistic structures, which I think really need to be overcome. It's interesting to hear you talk about whether a transhumanist technology can do harm, because it sounds like you're almost hinting at a future whereby not doing certain forms of technological intervention could be the thing that does harm. Do you think we'll end, ever end up with that flip inverse in, in that sort of future? This is, in, in, in some respects, that is already the case. I mean, with respect to the examples we just mentioned, we have the option of doing something and we, we don't do so. We don't allow that to, to occur. And as a consequence, more harm occurs in, in, in this life world. The question is, then it leads to a further question. And that, that is really interesting, actually. In how far should some of these procedures get morally obligatory, maybe even legally obligatory. And mm -hmm. that's, that's, that these are sort of the tricky issues. Sort of if we have a situation where, where we, by means of a genetic intervention, by means of CRISPR, Cas9 genome editing, it would be possible to, in a reliable fashion, without any significant side effects, increase the average life expectancy of a child by 30 years. If parents then decided not to do so, is that bad parenting? Should parents, is that negligence? Should parents then maybe have a moral, maybe even legal obligation to use the procedure? I mean, that's in mm -hmm. the end sort of the issues we are encountering with the vaccination debate right now. And these are difficult, difficult questions. And I'm not giving general answers to them because in any of these situations, we need to take the specific cultural situation into consideration so all i'm i'm trying to show now we have certain 
moral guidelines. And one of the moral guidelines is, I think, that negative freedom, the absence of constraint, the right of morphological freedom, the right to make decisions for yourself as long as you don't harm any other person. It's just an enormously important right. Mm. And this needs to be upheld and needs to be even promoted further. As long as this is being taken into consideration, then we can make further inferences to what are the implications concerning that specific uh, decisions. For example, should it be legally obligatory for, for a parent to, to genetically vaccinate the child in order to increase the chance of the child living healthily for another 30 years? These are the issues which we, we will probably have to have to address in the, in the not too far future. Now, a lot of people, they come to transhumanism through the sorts of technologies that are associated with transhumanism. And you do a wonderful job at categorizing some of those technologies, categorizing them as either silicon-based transhumanist technologies or carbon-based transhumanist technologies. So uh, what is the difference between the two and how does genetic cyborg or digital technologies, how do they all inform the transhumanist debate? Exactly. That's very important distinction which often does not get a sufficient amount of recognition in the debates because often transhumanism is simply identified with you know technological singularity mind uploading we will put the mind on a on a hard drive within the next 20 30 years that's what elon musk and his friends are proposing and and what they even defend in very high ranking political circles and that would be sort of the example of a of a of a silicon based transhumanism because we live in a silicon age silicon is the basis for computing and the idea is here of that silicon based transhumanism that the future developments of humans lies in us getting further connected to PCs and of our personalities then getting put on hard drives where the development will continue to take place after the event of singularity where maybe even sort of the indi the our individual personalities will as digital entities will de develop further mm. it could also be and some suggest no that developments of highly structured algorithm becoming more capable than humans will not be the re result of humans getting connected with computers but it, it will actually take place as a consequence of digital evolution itself mm. and this represents a certain silicon valley type of transhumanism as many people have firm it there. And there are many good reasons why that is extremely implausible, as I've, I've shown in the book, we've always been cyborgs. And I think we've got much more reasons to, to focus on the carbonate-based, carbon-based transhumanism, carbon-based as our organic bodies have a carbon basis. And that means here, in particular, with the technology of genome editing, in particular CRISPR-Cas9, but also in with respect to the possibilities of uh, brain computer interfaces of our bodies getting getting analyzed by means of big data maybe big gene data we we get enormously important insights for altering our our bodily capacities and then then break our boundaries with respect to living further as embodied as embodied beings as embodied post humans and not as as personalities who live in the cyberspace who live on a hard drive i mean i'm not excluding the other possibility but that's so far away in the future if it at all can be realized so whoever talks about them and and interestingly interestingly it's been discussed in you know in netflix series from from black mirror in in movies like transcendence it catches the emotions of many people and students and as well as researchers find it extremely fascinating but from a pragmatic perspective it has absolutely no relevance whatsoever and the intellectuals <laughs> in oxford who propose these ideas they get they get, you know, dealt with and referred to by, you know, world leading entrepreneurs. But all they talk is about is from my perspective, all they talk about is like a question on, on the size of angels. It's similar to the questions which in the Middle Ages, in the Middle Ages, people talked about how many angels fit on a needle spin. 
And on, on mm. the basis of the Christian medieval understanding, that question makes sense. If they're angels, you need to ask the question, how big are they? And how many <laughs> fit on the, you know, on a, on a tip of a needle's pin? So from the background of the cultural situation in the medieval times, it made fully sense and it crashed the attention of, of many scholars, theologian philosophers at the time. And in the same way, we now talk, nowadays talk about mind uploading, singularity, or us living in a computer simulation. And from the background of sort of the shared technological framework, which many people share, that makes sense. But from if you look at it from a moralistic philosophical perspective, then just, now, this is not going to happen in the next 30, 40, 50 years. This will not have any relevance for you. We need to focus on what is directly relevant for us. I'm not excluding the possibility it will happen, but this is not the questions which actually will have any significant impact on your life. And I'm not downplaying the possibility of digitalization. Digitalization has enormously important impact on our life, but it's not going to be about mind uploading. It's about, it's about the issues of privacy, of collecting data and what we do with the data, which really are important and which we need to take seriously. Well, one of those directly relevant figures or technologies is the idea of the cyborg. And, and you give the cyborg a certain importance, a certain conceptual importance, because as we're beginning to see ever smaller computers integrate and enter the body, that does something to how we think about who and what we are, because it doesn't just allow us to do certain things out in society and the world, but it dissolves philosophical boundaries between the human and technology. So why is this, this idea of the cyborg, so conceptually important in your work? The cyborg as an entity consists of two different parts. The cyber part comes from the Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is an ancient Greek term which stands for the helmsman, the steersperson of a ship. Orc is an abbreviation for organism. So we have carbonate organic parts and we've got mechanical or we've got mechanical or silicon based uh, cyber parts however it doesn't only have to be mechanical or silicon based kubernetes cyber stands for any type of steering mm -hmm. and and steering is something which shapes us we are being steered we are being altered as organisms once we get born we get born and then our parents steer us, our parents mm -hmm. alter us. We get born without having the capacity of language and then our parents upgrade us with language. And language is a fascinating feature. Language is sort of the basic requirement for rationality. And the traditional explanation for how we gained rationality w was a different one. And that was a dominant one in the Western tradition. It goes back to Plato, to Cicero, to Pico della Mirandola, Manetti, Kant. They all affirmed that our rationality is something immaterial. Mm. We gained it as a consequence of some divine spark getting attached to our bodies, something immaterial and something material getting united. So the explanation for how we gained language, how we gained rationality was related to the substance, something unchanging, something non-material. And that stands for the dominant anthropology, for the dominant human nature, which we all, which was generally accepted in our culture for 2000 years and more. And so us being represented by the cyborg is a breakaway from that cultural tradition by realizing, no, we didn't get language as a consequence of God placing it there, attaching it to our body, animation taking place at the, at the time of fertilization. As Pius IX said in the second half of the 19th century, he clearly stated the official Catholic doctrine, which is still valid, which basically said, animation and that means the rational soul the rational soul getting connected to the human body occurs at fertilization and that's why abortion is illegal and so on mm. and so by us representing or us being seen as cyborgs as gaining rationality and language as a consequence of external factors as part of education as a consequence of environmental changes 
that is a paradigm shift concerning how we conceptualize us as human beings. And in addition, it also reveals that we are entirely part of the world. We are not standing out by having as the sole entity something which is immaterial, but we are we are entirely part of that sensually accessible world. We are entirely be empirically accessible, just like all the other animals and plants and so on. So we are not categorically different, but merely gradually different from other animals. And um, as a consequence, it doesn't justify that anthropocentric stance that highlights that only humans possess dignity whereas other animals do not. And that's that's an important anthropocentric shift, which many people nowadays also find extremely plausible. But on a, on a legal level, this shift has not yet taken, has been has not been acknowledged appropriately. Mm. Because basically in all the countries in the world, animals are not classified as persons. There's one exception, which recently happened in Argentina, with respect to Sandra, the orangutan, who was actually recognized as a person and as a consequence had to be freed from the zoo there. And this is what the implications are. And so it, it really is a fundamental paradigm shift. And on a legal level, we still live in that um, Judeo-Christian Kantian tradition, which highlights that we as humans are superior to all the rest of the world, which is highly dangerous and highly problematic and implausible. Well, listening to you speak there, it sounds like education itself is one of the oldest forms of human enhancement technology. And if we consider education as a enhancement technology, how does that change the way we think about different technological interventions that could lead to human enhancement? Yeah, wonderful question, actually, because education is sort of the paradigmatically the process which clearly is identified with enhancing human capacities and and humans that's it's even an obligation for parents to enhance their children yeah. <laughs> um, it's an obligation for parents to send their kids to school to 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 provide them with the knowledge of mathematics and and the mother tongue and and learning about history if they don't send their kids to school then that's negligence of the child they you know the state can remove the children from the family and if you realize that the goal of of the emerging technologies is just the same as with respect to traditional forms of education that will lead to reclassifications of how we see things like genetic modifications. If we manage to, I mean, by means of genetic modifications, manage to realize an increase of the capacity of doing of the mathematical IQ by by 10 or 20 points then this is also the goal why you send your kids to school so why should it be so, somehow be bad if you use a genetic inter intervention if for the same reason you try to achieve that goal by sending your kids to school and it's even a moral and even a legal obligation to do so and so the question is just one of reliability and the side effects. And that's what we obviously need to work on by making these new technologies reliable. But by first realizing that gene technologies, brain-computer interfaces are in tune with what humans have always been doing, um, that, leads us, that leads us to a re-evaluation re of these technologies. And it also makes us accept them more. And even us becoming human is part of an educational structure. Us learning language is part of education. In that way, the new technologies are not something radically new in the sense that they, they represent something which is categorically different from what we've always been doing, but it's in tune with what we've always been doing, as long as we promote the goals which we reg regard as appropriate. And in that sense, yes, we should use genetic modifications on our children if the same goals, if appropriate goals can be realized. But it's the same as with traditional forms of education. You know, not all types of education are morally legitimate. Some cases of education sh should rather be classified as child abuse. And the same can be the case with respect to genetic modifications. But at least it also shows, no, if the goal is appropriate, then a genetic modification should rather be seen as a as a moral duty, maybe even as a legal duty. And it's definitely something which 
can also be strongly affirmed and should be affirmed as the same goals can be realized as with respect to traditional forms of education. Well, if mind uploading is the exemplar of silicon-based transhumanism, then it certainly feels like gene editing is the exemplar of carbon-based transhumanism. And you say explicitly that genome editing might actually be the most important scientific invention of the beginning of the 21st century. So what are some of the implications of gene editing and what has biotechnology like this already made possible and how might it go forward to enhance our entire Higher evolution. So gene technologies uh, in, in general are extremely promising. So uh, genome editing and with that, so CRISPR-Cas9, which I briefly mentioned, is just one branch of gene technologies. There are other types of gene technologies and one I briefly mentioned earlier, and that is uh, related to choosing eggs, have in vitro fertilization. That's become a standard application and standard technology. Then we can take some of the cells, uh, then we can fertilize, then the eggs need to be fertilized. And as a consequence, we can remove one or two cells and, and use them for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And then as a co we can see, it enables us to see what are the, the qualities, the likely capacities, the likely diseases, what, what's the likelihood of how the, 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 the entities, the later human will respond to certain drugs, which capacities of memories they will have. These are all insights we can already have on the basis of a gene analysis. And that is one example of a technology, a gene technology, which already works extremely well. And in some parts of the world, is it's already legitimate to apply these technologies to a certain degree. So with respect to influencing procreation and even in improving procreation, improving the capacities, improving the likelihood of the your child living a better life, having a better life can be realized and, and has already been realized by means of that technology. And then the next step would be the one with genome editing, CRISPR-Cas9, where we can actually, where it's not about selecting specific fertilized eggs and then implementing the most promising ones with respect to their good life, but actually changing the genes. And we recently had sort of the famous example which took place in in China, where where some physician was was doing that on some offspring of, of couples where where one of the partners was HIV positive. And mm. he realized a gene modification, which is basically a genetic vaccination, because the goal was to make the children immune immune to HIV. Yeah. And there was a major outcry because of the riskiness, because it was not necessary to implement these such a risky technologies, because in principle, someone even who's HIV positive with the latest drugs could still live a decent, normal life. So it, it, it was not necessary to implement these technologies, but, the, you know, it was done on such a basis that the parents actually gave consent to that intervention. Mm. And, and the physician was not a random physician, uh, was not a random scientist, but he was a highly trained uh, scientist based on the best U.S. American institution in that field. And, and that's about, you know, it's about taking certain risks. Yeah. And that's what, what's being done in the past. And we've had enormously important achievements. I mean, sometimes the, the, the interventions which occurred have been extremely problematic. I mean, in the case, hmm. for example, of the, the physician uh, in the, the UK physician in the 19th century who had some insights concerning how to get rid of smallpox about realizing a smallpox vaccination. He, he got the idea, he, he, he realized the concept, and then applied the concept which he developed to a farmer's boy after he had infected the farmer's boy with smallpox, which is obviously, that is, you know, morally highly dubious and problematic. As a consequence, of, however, of that intervention, we actually managed to get rid of smallpox because it worked. Mm. And now we've eradicated smallpox as a consequence of the vac vaccination all over the world. So the beginning might have been or was extremely dubious, but in the end, sort of the consequence that it had for, for millions and millions of, of, of human beings 
uh, that we no longer have smallpox. We can get vaccinated against it and it no longer exists, which is wonderful. And so if this gene vaccination, which which was undertaken in China, again, you know, making um, immune to HIV has worked, which is seemed to have had, and it can be reproduced in a reliable manner. I think that would be absolutely wonderful. We could actually, you know, manage to get rid of HIV, which would, would be an enormously important achievement. So we can, we can already see this, the advantages and, and, and genome editing is widely applied with respect to plants and other animals and it's functioning without any side effects. So here we see masses of applications. And a further step, which I think is, is extremely interesting are the possibilities of animal hybrids, which, which can be realized. And here, the example concerning the genetically modified heart, which has been realized by Martin Rosplatt's company, and as a consequence of which we, we've managed to transplant a genetically modified pig's heart into a human, that has the pot potential to save the life of hundreds and thousands of, of people who are in need of, of organ transplants. So these are just a couple of examples because you could mention even further from, from, from bioprinting and, and, and other possibilities from changing adult stem cells into embryonic stem says and playing around with the, the the possibilities and the achievements are myriad and that's why i think the achievements if we apply big data analysis to our genes to finding out more concerning correlations between our genes and diseases the likelihood of human flourishing of feeling good and the interrelations between how we act and how that has which epigenetic effects this has as on our, our genes if we get more insights on that, that's a prerequisite for actually influencing our genes in a more direct manner by means of genome editing. And this is going to be the most important developments in the, in the forthcoming decades. So the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st might have been sort of a silicon age. The future will rather be sort of the cyborg age or maybe even a biological age because we'll use the digital technologies and get information on biotechnologies in order to use them for increasing the likelihood of us living good lives. But that is, I think, extremely wonderful. And there's so many companies actually working on that mm. right now, in particular with respect to the expansion of the health span. So I'm, I'm extremely positive and hopeful with respect to these developments to continue in the future. Well, well, it certainly feels like there are a myriad of possibilities, but when we often talk about transhumanist interventions or transhumanist technologies, they can sometimes feel very science fictional. They're nascent possibilities that may or may not come to pass. The way some transhumanists talk about mind uploading is as if it's going to be inevitable. The reality is <laughs> there's no guarantee that some of these things will actually come to pass. But why should we take something like mind uploading philosophically seriously? I mean, is there anything to it? What do we learn when we engage in these philosophical debates about nascent or possible future technologies? Um, or are we going down this this rabbit hole and wasting a lot of time that could be spent <laughs> on on other philosophical arguments, debates and ideas? No, it's it's a matter of what should we prioritize. And, <laughs> yes. and if, if you ask me about a prioritization, then I, I would rather focus on on things which seems on the technologies, cyborg intervention, brain computer interfaces, uh, gene technologies, and, and we should focus on them much more. We should focus much more on issues like ex increasing the human health span because that's what most people want. And, and, and a, a lot of companies and, and so on are doing so. On the other hand, it seems to resonate quite strongly with many people, um, sort of that rather escapist stream of us getting uploaded on a, on a, on a computer. But I'm also asking Stefan, if we take the idea that we can upload a human mind or transfer it to silicon, if we take that seriously and we have those philosophical discussions and we have those debates out in the world, do we learn something about what it means to be human today in the present from doing that sort of speculative philosophizing? Or are we making these technologies feel like they're more real than they actually are? 
I think it's both. <laughs> both <laughs> is the case. We definitely feel we, we make them more realistic and realizable than they actually are, as I've you know argued, just uh -huh. tried to say before. But of course, there's some value. There's some philosophical value. They're engaging with this understanding because they highlight or make us reflect upon who we are as human beings. Mm. Is it possible at all to upload or to transfer our personality in a digital manner? The, the, the basic issue which it raises, because um, digital entities are discrete entities, which means they are made out of ones and zeros. And it's still an open question of how the universe, how our organism, whether our organism is can be reduced to ones and zeros, mm. or whether our organism is a continuous entity. And if it is a continuous entity, then it would be in principle impossible to, to upload our personality without any loss. Because a continuous entity, if you transfer a continuous entity towards into a, or change it to a discrete entity, something's getting lost. And then the entire goal of us, you know, wanting to, to, to be uploaded couldn't even be realized because we would lose something which might be extremely important part of of who we are as human beings mm. but in the end it's an open question i don't know whether whether who we are what we are the energy which exists is actually structured discreetly or continuously and from our physical insights there are actually hints concerning both types of understanding so on the one hand we are all energy can only turn up as a as a multiplicity of the Planck constant, either one times the Planck constant, twice the Planck constant, three times the Planck constant. And if this is the case, then the Planck constant could be the one in the one and zeros. Then the entire world and the entire way energy could be structured could be structured discreetly. And if this is the case, then mind uploading in principle could work. If, on the other hand, it's the case that that we are structured and energy is 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 continuously and something like us being unable once we grasp the, the speed of a particle we can't locate the location of the part particle and uh, all of this rather seems to us which reveals to us a sort of a, the world consisting of a continuity of energies of being permanently more divisible without being an endpoint. In that case, if this is who we actually are, then mind uploading in principle could not be possible. Mm. So it, it's, it's, it's a very philosophically an extremely interesting question of how our basic energy, how, what we are, what we are permanently becoming, whether it can be structured discreetly or continuously. Philosophically, it's very interesting. I just wouldn't want it to become politically too, too effective but because in that way, a lot of money would be wasted and which could be much better spent on reducing the suffering in the world. What happens when someone such as yourself comes out and starts talking about these ideas, these almost science fictional ideas in a very serious and academic way? Uh, people assume they're going to become inevitable. And I wonder if there's a certain degree of danger in being an academic who has also come out as a transhumanist. I mean, how do you, how do you ethically navigate mm. this space? <laughs> Actually... Uh, raises sort of a, the fun, a fundamental issue about what should be dealt with it at, at universities in general. So should <laughs> yeah. should you have uh, theological departments at universities, or because that's what what everyone's talking about there about all these fundamental questions are such that you 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 cannot you cannot test them empirically. It's about uh, rational speculations, mm. exegesis of the minds. They raise some very fundamental issues. What counts as a proper scientific endeavor? Ever. And I think the important thing is why why I do take it uh, them seriously because it resonates with so many people. And I'm trying to show. Let's have a look at the implications. Uh, let's have a look what what that would mean. How we how the digital world relates to the to the non digital world to the world. Is there if in principle actually I might even go a step further and and say that. If we're all part made out of the same kind of energy, empirically accessible energy, and energy is can be transformed in a, in a vast amount of different ways, 
And it is also the case that every seven years, all the cells in our organisms will be replaced. Mm. But our memory, our personality gets passed on. That clearly shows that the information which is attached to these cells can also be passed on. So it's not necessarily di directed or connected to the cells in our brain, to the cells in our body. And so the issue gets raised, what is different with respect to carbon based cells and silicon based cells is it in principle possible that we can sort of transfer some of the functions some of the information from one of the bases to another one and and it is already possible and we've we've realized that when when realizing brain computer interfaces sort of kevin warwick is a wonderful example when he, he, he uh, sort of realized when he was in in new york and he had sort of the brain computer interface uh, connected to his hat and he was thinking about moving the robot hand at his laboratory laboratory in the UK to the table with sensors on the tip of his fingers, on his fingertips, on the fingertips of the robot, moving, moving to the table, the sensors feeling the surface of the table, and him being in, at Columbia University in, in the US, feeling what the table feels like in the UK. And and sort of this sort of seems to reveal that maybe between the organic and the non-organic world, there is not such a big gap. And we need to investigate the, the possible relations and in how far mm. some of the activities or some of the information which is stored in our organic basis can actually also be stored in a non-organic basis. And that could also enable us quite a lot of further options because my memory is very bad and the memory of my hard drive is very good. <laughs> so if some of the issues were realizable, then that would be in, in, in many human beings' interest. But that is very far and storing some information or transferring some of the information from, from a you know, non-organic basis to an organic basis is very different from having life being placed from having consciousness from having self-consciousness and rationality being placed on a hard drive so um, a lot will be possible with respect to brain computer interface i'm already curious what Neuralink will achieve in the in the you know near future mm -hmm. because i heard they're going to start the trials later this year with humans so a, a lot of will be possible but that's still far away from actually having living entities, from suffering digital entities, from self-conscious living entities, from then competent self-conscious living entities in cyberspace. That is science fiction. Come on, you don't, that's not going to happen. Not in the, the next 30 years, not in the next 100 years. If it will ever happen in the future, we'll see. But a lot of possibilities are given. And by investigating these possibilities, by taking seriously the possibilities of mind uploading, we can get a better grasp of what is worthy of trying out and what is pure science fiction. What's extremely important in your work and the way in which you write, it, it's about engaging with the future to decide what is useful, to bring into the present, and then use that to think about our current global challenges. And one of the ways in which we can do that is to not just look at the uh, figure of the transhuman or the posthuman, but something in between, the meta-human. Firstly, what is it? And secondly, how is it a useful tool with which to engage with these technologies, not just in the future, but importantly, in the present? So the meta-human is, as a concept, originated as part of the engagement I've had not only with the transhumanist discourses, mm -hmm. but also as a consequence I've had with critical posthumanist discourses, which is an, an entirely different field. It's a whole other podcast. It's a, <laughs> a, a whole other podcast, not, not only one, several other podcasts. So, um, <laughs> And that is related to sort of that postmodern literary way of thinking that is related, that is very strong at uni in universities. And, and I've, I've been engaged with both types of approaches with sort of the, this techno optimistic transhumanist approach, which I share, but I've also got 
philosophically a lot of resonance with the critical posthumanist approach, which is more rooted in, in, in the sort of a continental European philosophical tradition. And I, I think both of these approaches are overstepping the boundaries are going too far. And by, by coining the matter human, by coining also the matter humanism as a, as an approach as well, uh, you realize there is something extremely important in both of these approaches. And it's a mm -hmm. way of balancing and making more accessible and more plausible what is actually a, a realistic way of dealing with the various approaches. I mean, in the same way as transhumanism in the end uh, can lead to the expectation of uh, us being uploaded minds in 10 years time in the same way as sort of the critical post-humanist then talk about climate change as a major issue. And climate change is a major issue. That's a very important task. But if you do think climate change is the most serious challenge we need to confront, then you would have a, a moral obligation not to procreate yourself. And, and some people might take that on and some people do take that on, but that's as absurd and as problematic as the mind uploading option. And that's why we will need to navigate. No, humans have interest and these human interests also need to be taken seriously. No, it's not that we as humans are the major driving force of claiming chase. We are, mm. but that doesn't mean it would be best if humans vanishes from the earth, which some critical post-humanists take on board, which is, it's, it's an absolute utopian nightmare and absolute absurdity. <laughs> and I'm not even mentioning the names to talk about that, that suggestion because it's, it's, that is seriously not something which should be taken seriously in the academic context. So I'm just saying, you know, just throw that approach out of the window and anyone who takes that approach and doesn't commit suicide herself then should not be taken seriously either maybe wow. i don't know this is sort of if you this is maybe overstating the case but but you know if you say you know humans are the worst thing in the world and then uh, or uh, the major driving force that has some really terrible implications actually i find that extremely dangerous mm. i do take climate change seriously and i think it's an important issue but we need to deal with it in a different way and sort of the meta human as an approach is, is a way you know there are in important factors which critical post-humanists take on board with a non-dualistic, non-essentialist and non-anthropocentric sense, which is what I'm sharing. Mm. In the same as what, you know, using the technologies in order to break free from the, from the personal boundaries which we currently have does increase the likelihood of us living good lives. That's what I also take on share with the transhumanist that doesn't lead me to, to mind uploading. So the matter human is really that, that negotiating as good as it gets approach. Well, what I'm hearing and what I've read in the book and what I'm hearing from this episode is it's less about how we have a relationship with technology, because the relationship with technology is almost inevitable. It's written on the front of the book. We've always been cyborgs. We've always had this transitory relationship with our technology. And that relationship, you can say, is quote unquote natural. So then the question becomes, how do we then uh, use that understanding of our relationship with nature to allow us to create the correct sort of technological solutions for the problems that we have today? And how do we perhaps refocus some transhumanists on these real world challenges in order to uh, maintain a sustainable existence for not just humans, but all persons? We definitely have to have permanent negotiation process. So we shouldn't take any of the answers for granted. <laughs> and even the answers which were valid maybe just a year ago, um, they're no longer valid now. And actually the best example or the best practicing case was the current <laughs> the current pandemic crisis for that because you know many politicians said we shouldn't implement obligatory vaccinations two years ago we'll never do that we promise and now they realize maybe we should do that i'm not even certain whether that's the appropriate stance but you know just to it shows that some things which have been categorically taken for granted just two years ago are no longer valid because the external situation, because research has brought up new information. And, and how fast things can change 
even on a cultural level, just a very good example now, you know, 50 years ago, homosexuality was a criminal offense. Now, a marriage for all is wi widely taken for granted. And that shows, no, things can change extremely quickly. And it's, it's all contingent. Everything's subject, subject to change. We can modify things. Even, even the maximum lifespan is not something which we should take for granted. It's, and, and it's, it's this openness, this openness for creativity, for being able to engage in also some, maybe some wild speculation sometimes and engaging with some crazy ideas, which lead us to important breakthroughs. And it's, it's in the end, it's, it's a sort of a fight again against essences, mm. the fight against stability, because I realized in the end what Heraclitus realized, and he was the first philosopher I ever read. When I was 13, I started reading Heraclitus and his sort of, <laughs> you can never step into the same river twice, is still sort of the guiding, the guiding insight I have in mind. It's we all in a permanent process of continual becoming of continual change where hybrids in a permanent process of change and that also means none of the insights and none of the things which we take as impossible have to be taken as such mm. it's all subject to change it's also that doesn't mean that everything's realizable and that also and in particular applies to to moral insights morality the good the bad that which was taken as unchanging and necessary and eternally valid and real that is not the case morals are fictions and they're human made fictions and you mm. always need to look at the interests which are being served by the ones who, who present a certain account of the good. You know, this is, I affirm a certain understanding of the good. And then you look, what's your int underlying interest, the motive, why and how far does it help you in some way? And maybe it's just the motive, the underlying instinct, the advantage, why you affirm that kind of uh, concept of the good. And in particular, sort of when it comes to mor morals, which are being affirmed as eternally valid and unchanging, this is where it gets dangerous and absurd. And I've I've had a recent I've had a discussion with a German realist philosopher, mm. and he basically said, "No, of course human dignity exists. There's like the essence of human dignity. That's something an eternal and essentialist, essentially valid moral insight." And and then you just wonder. I mean, you, you're a very clever, highly intelligent guy. You know, there was a big bang. There was the expansion process. The Earth came about about four billion years ago. Uh, humans and apes, the last common ancestors, lived about six million years ago. And 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 the human dignity, as it's present in the German foundational law, is has just waited uh, fourteen billion years to unfold itself in the German constitution. You cannot be real. That's just absolutely <laughs> absurd. And that's. The stance concerning all the lifting your eyebrow high moralities which claim for uh, universal validity and you realize the, the 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 importance of of also embracing norms as as being contingent as being fictions mm -hmm. that doesn't mean they shouldn't be effective it's important to have them but it's also important to regard that they are human made and that they can be altered and all i'm presenting are fictions and i'm trying to convince you you know i'm trying to show their plausibility and luckily many of these insights are being shown and be, are being shared by many people but that doesn't mean that they are in any way better founded or in any way have a better metaphysical essentialist foundation as as than what anyone else affirmed and it's this the permanent contingency which i think is an, an enormously important achievement also in order to avoid violence being done to other persons and to increase the plurality and diversity of human flourishing, which is a wonderful, wonderful goal, which I try to promote in diff permanently different ways, because there will never be a perfect state in which it can be fully realized. 
Well, th there we have it. We should stay open to a multitude of possibilities. Stefan, uh, this is exactly the reason why I started this podcast, to have discussions like this. And it certainly feels like uh, we could have a podcast episode on every single chapter of your book and every single section, in fact, of, of your book. And on that note, I just want to thank you for being a guest on the Futures Podcast. Oh, many thanks for having me. It's been a great pleasure. It's always a great pleasure meeting you and talking to you. I'm looking forward to doing so in person again hopefully sometime soon thank you to stefan for showing us how the future human could be defined by either silicon-based or carbon-based transhumanist technologies you can find out more by purchasing his new book we have always been cyborgs digital data gene technologies and the ethics of transhumanism available now if you like what you've heard then you can subscribe for our latest episode or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Futures Podcast. More episodes, transcripts, and show notes can be found at futurespodcast.net. Thank you for listening to the Futures Podcast.